Across the Fence, we're going to meet a world-renowned expert in the field of grazing. He's in Vermont to talk about the best practices for raising animals and sharing advice on making the tastiest burger. Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. We're all familiar with the ads that told us beef, it's what's for dinner. Well, left out of that marketing sizzle is the science, management, and hard work it takes to bring that meat to the market. Jim Garrish has dedicated his life to helping farmers and ranchers manage their grazing lands for environmental and economic stability. He's visiting Vermont at the invitation of UVM Center for Sustainable Agriculture and as part of his visit Garish is working with Vermont's beef producers. Jim joins me in the studio along with Jen Colby of UVM Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Welcome to both of you. And so Jim give us a little bit of information about your background just so folks know. Well my background I grew up a flatland Illinois crop farmer but I got over that. <laughs> Uh, after uh, growing up on the farm, I went to University of Illinois, got a degree in agronomy, then went to graduate school at University of Kentucky, where I got a uh, master's degree in crop ecology, went to work at the University of Missouri, was on the University of Missouri staff or faculty for 22 years, three months, resigned from that position in 2003, went into private business, 2004, moved to Idaho, and since that time, I've uh, run a ranch out there. I do consulting uh, nationally and internationally, speak at a lot of uh, workshops and conferences. I was here in Vermont uh, two winters ago for the Vermont Grazers Conference and I just go around and have fun looking at cattle, talking about grass and meeting all kinds of interesting people. So what kinds of farms do you work with? <laughs> no, a wide array. Mm -hmm. in, in a state like Vermont, uh, of course farms tend to be smaller um, and beef cattle, sheep, dairy, our largest consulting client is a 14,000 cow ranch. So it's uh, across a very wide spectrum, private land, public land, uh, in the rainforests, in the deserts, kind of all over. Wow, so what are you talking with farmers about when you visit Vermont? Here in Vermont, we've got two basic themes. One is uh, producing grass-fed beef, but to be able to produce grass-fed beef uh, effectively, you have to know a lot about basic grazing management, soil plant animal relationships. So we start out talking about uh, fundamentals of grazing and then put the focus on uh, grass-fed beef, though we've talked a bit about uh, grass-fed lamb as well. And so Jen, why did you decide to, to bring Jim to meet with Vermont farmers? So several years ago when we had Jim as the, as the keynote speaker, he did, um, in addition to the keynote, he did a full workshop day for experienced grazers. And um, really what came out of that was a, a real desire and feedback from the folks who attended those workshops to be able to see Jim and learn from Jim during the grazing season. Um, because it's great to learn in the classroom, it's great to take notes, and then six months later when the grass is green, it's not always easy to, to get a reality check on the things that you've learned in the classroom. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to bring Jim to do a little reality check for us. You know, for folks who aren't farmers, Jim, people probably think, well, what's the big deal with grazing? You put the animals out on grass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a huge it, science to it, There's a there? huge science yeah. to it, and yes, there are a lot of farmers and ranchers who that's basically what they do. They just put them out on some pasture or some rangeland. And what they get from that is somewhere between a quarter and 50% of the production potential of that land. Uh, the continuous presence of livestock is a cause for concern. There are people out there who think grazing is a horrible thing. It's destroying the environment. And I'm sad to say that I've seen some of the places where that is true. Uh, managed grazing, however, uh, builds up. There's a lot of positive factors for the environment. The land use efficiency goes up, the health of the land goes up, and the farmer's uh, income should also go up with good management. So Jen, what are some of the challenges that Vermont farmers face when it comes to grazing their livestock? So we increasingly have challenges of too much or too little water. Um, as, as <laughs> last year and this year, perfect last year, examples. Exactly, too little last year, too much water this year. Um, and being profitable. We have a, a, a wonderful and very vibrant um, local food economy in Vermont. And at the same time, when you run the numbers on, on um, 
livestock operations, it's still really challenging because we still have a, a long period where we need to feed stored feed. So we need to make the most out of our pastures uh, so that we so that farmers can make enough money to survive through those stored feed months. And so, Jim, what have you learned from other places that can benefit Vermont farmers? So, I, as I said, I work in the desert. I work in the rainforest, mm -hmm. and a lot of farmers and ranchers don't get that far away from their home base and they seem to think that uh, going to see grazing in Wyoming, how could that help me? Right. I mean that's the desert or looking at center pivot irrigation, how could that possibly help me? But the, the basic uh, principles, the truth of the matter is uh, grazing, the, the basic plant animal soil relationship is, the, is similar in all environments. Yeah, there's details that are different. Mm -hmm. And as an example, so our, we're, we had our farm in Missouri, average precipitation was 38 to 40 inches. Yeah, that's pretty nice. Where we moved in Idaho, the annual precipitation is less than eight inches. Wow. But we also have that wonderful magic of irrigation, center pivot irrigation. And in Missouri, I thought that I really uh, was doing good things with the water cycle, capturing rainfall, using it effectively. And after having gone to work in the desert, you truly under, begin to appreciate the value of a drop of water. And the consistency of irrigation makes you understand how important it is to keep things green and actively growing. So you take those two extreme perspectives and it will actually give you a much better understanding of whatever your local climate is, whatever your local rainfall environment is, by looking at the extremes, you will get a, a better understanding. And now, you know, Jen mentioned that there's the situation of too much rainfall, but there's probably plenty of years when rainfall is also limited. Right. And so there are management strategies that we can use to ensure that the water that does fall stays in our soil and can be used for subsequent plant growth. Why is it important, do you think, to have animals grass-fed versus grain-fed? Because we see in the grocery store, they're all different labels. Um, why is grass-fed better than grain-fed? You going with that one, Jen? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I yeah. can do it, too. No, absolutely. Uh, both, I'd like to yeah. hear from both of you, actually, yeah. <laughs> so I spent some time this spring um, learning from some folks who've been doing this research, and it's extremely complicated. It's new science that we're, that we're learning um, mm -hmm. about the benefits of the fats, primarily, um, that are in grass-fed grass and grass-finished um, meats. And um, those fatty acids, uh, they go away, they decline in the presence of grain. Mm. And so grass-fed and finishing with grain will actually undo much of the good work health-wise in the fatty acids that were, that were performed by good grazing management to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so the bottom line here is for farmers to get more money for what they're producing. Yes. By producing the best beef they can. Yes, and, and I believe that, that Jim's expertise is very much about reducing the costs of, of that production as well, so that the business is working at both ends to um, be able to be more profitable. You, what, what are you telling farmers in Vermont? Farmers in Vermont, um, they have such an opportunity with the, the local market. The culture in Vermont and more broadly in the Northeast is really moving towards that local food supply. Uh, part of it is the idea of supporting the community, but also as uh, Jen referenced, the composition of the meat itself from pasture-based products. And we can talk about uh, pasture-based dairy, beef, lamb, even poultry and pork. Mm -hmm. It's a different composition than what's coming out of the, um, the CAFO, the Confined Animal Feeding Operations. And there's an increase in concern people have for their health and well-being, beginning to understand that our diet affects every aspect of our health. Cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, depression, uh, schizophrenia has been shown to originate out of a dysfunctional gut. So uh, people want to be healthier, they want to have healthier communities, and so that's why they're, the interest is there. Uh, specifically, what can they do? Farmers here can do a better job of capturing solar energy. 
Um, there's plenty of land that simply does is not as productive as it could be right. because the plant community, the growth stage of the plants where they're keeping them, isn't op operating at optimal photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. So that's very fundamental. Um, grazing management is a tool that we can use to manipulate the composition of the pasture. And biodiversity, plant diversity above ground, affects the microbial diversity below ground, which affects the nutrient cycle, which affects or, uh, the water cycle as well. So ev everything is linked together, but the fundamental key is maximizing photosynthesis per acre. Mm -hmm. And also too, I guess then moving, moving your herd regularly to get to let the land recover, mm -hmm. but then also get better nutrients as mm -hmm. you move on. Yeah, the, one of the key aspects of grazing management, and when I was in uh, at the university in the 1970s, you know, doing my training, and no forage class or animal science class that I took was the importance of time management, the amount of time that the pasture and the soil is exposed to animals at an interval, never ever talked about. And what I've learned over the last 40 years is that time management is the key essential to make every, making everything work together. Is it as, is it as easy as, as punching in a ratio as far as I have X number of cattle on X number of acres, which means they produce X amount of nutrients on those acres and compression, and then you gotta move them every 20 days, 30 days? 10 we, days? We move every day. Every day. Since uh, the drought, Midwest drought of 1988, I've been moving livestock every day and have never gone back to anything less than that. You know, uh, dairy farmers feed their cattle every day. Makes perfect sense to them. Mm -hmm. feeding, feeding fresh feed to beef cows, beef steers, ewes, lambs, makes just as much sense. And again, if we had all day to talk about it, I'd <laughs> ex explain the full de details of, of all of it. But time management is absolutely critical to keeping the land healthy and productive. Jen, does Vermont uh, have farmers who are finishing animals on grass? And how can somebody find out about that if you're a consumer? How, how do you know that? So the, the, yes, there are farmers who are finishing on grass and doing so very well, very intentionally, very, very well. Um, I would say one of the best places is to just to get to know the farmers themselves. So going to farmer's market is a good way to talk to the farmers and learn more about you know what their finishing practices are like, what their production practices are like. Um, the Vermont Grass Farmers Association and the um, UVM Pasture Program are both places to help uh, consumers get connected to uh, farmers who might be able to, to fit their food needs. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. So it's really as a consumer, take the time to find out what you're eating. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that I think we all need to do as consumers, every one of us. Okay, we've got about a minute left, Jim. So, so if you had your choice, what kind, of, what kind of meat would you eat and why? What's the best? Well, some of my friends are going to be shocked to hear this. If <laughs> I was told for the rest of my life there's only one type of meat that you can eat, it would be lamb. Yes. Really? Why? Because why? the flavor is... Uh, so rich in lamb, and I could also throw out the biological efficiency of sheep is greater than uh, cattle, but I've eaten lamb literally all over the world, and I just really enjoy lamb. And you were telling me earlier before we started taping this program, um, it's really important to know your local providers, buy local beef, because in the grocery store, it, even though it might say yeah, grass-fed. Right now in the grocery stores, uh, meat product labeled as grass-fed, uh, 80 to 85 percent of that is not a product of the U.S. It's South American or Australian beef typically. So the best way to know that you are getting a true 100 percent grass-fed product to get all the associated health benefits and to support your local economy is get to know your farmer. Find a local supplier who is producing the type of meat that you enjoy eating and stick with that source. Well, for more information on pasturing animals, you can visit the UVM Center for Sustainable Agriculture. The website is listed on your screen, and you can click on the link to pasture 
program. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, and thank you, Judy, for having us. Absolutely. Thanks, Judy. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. <laughs>